It is certainly the kind of thinking that is embedded, I believe, in the education of, the, of business students in MBA programs. And it is implicit in Milton Friedman's shareholder model of the firm, which states that the sole purpose of the firm is to improve the stock price. After all, if only the interests of the shareholders count, then there can be no common purpose that involves all members of the firm. By this kind of thinking, but this kind of thinking, Mr. Stack says, is capable of destroying the company from within. What Jack Stack set out to create was a community of entrepreneurs rather than just a collection of people with jobs. Indeed, Stack wanted to do away with jobs and the employee mentality altogether. <laughs> but the primary problem is that people have been trained to see themselves in terms of jobs rather than in terms of, of creative entrepreneurship. They see themselves merely as performing a function for somebody else, usually somebody very remote. Creating this community meant realizing that the business was not an end in itself, but a means to an end. A tool that allows us to accomplish the things that matter most to us, and those things must transcend business to have real meaning and value. To accomplish this goal, to create this community, Springfield Remanufacturing used two means, education and equity sharing. To educate members of the firm, it would be wrong to say employees, Stack invented a system of informal but continuous education he called the great game of business. If the workers are going to take responsibility for the firm, they must know the rules of business. And the great game was the means of teaching those rules, from the simplest to the most complex. As Stack evaluates the results of the game, he notes that, quote, we have had dozens of employees rise from the shop floor to top management positions, and they're far better qualified than a lot of MBAs I see, end quote. The game required that the firm practice open book management. If all members of the firm are be, to be responsible for the firm, then they must all have equal access to the books. Further, you cannot truly educate employees unless they can see how their actions affect the firm. And this is impossible without looking at the books. But the greatest benefit, as Jack Stack notes, is that when you open your books, really open them, you also open your mind. And neither your mind nor your books will ever be closed again. Continuous education and open book management frees the firm from the constraints of the division of labor which confines each worker to just one task. And from the quasi-militaristic top-down management, which confines responsibility to just one group. The results of this culture at SRC have been nothing short of phenomenal. In 20 years, sales went from 16 million to 185 million. <laughs> With sim similar results or profit uh, and retained earnings. But it's in the area of shareholder equity that the firm really stands out because all the shares are owned by the workers. The company had 727 worker owners, of whom only five were the original owners. The other 722 shareholders own 64% of the firm. This point is crucial because owning their work must involve real ownership <coughs> and not just some psychic substitute. Equity sharing defines the community, a community built on the premise that all members of the community must 
share in the wealth that the community creates. That is, that it must be a commonwealth. This notion of sharing the output is what we call distributive justice. It has been an intrinsic part of our understanding of justice from the time of Aristotle until relatively recent times. Now, remember I said at the beginning, there seems to be something missing from modern economic theory that causes them to miss one crisis after another. Let me suggest that what they cannot account for is distributive justice. And without accounting for distributive justice, they cannot give a rational description of any economy. And if they can't describe it, then they can't see even the most obvious of disasters taking place until it is too late. Now, this enlightened way of viewing business allows the Pope to imagine new forms of enterprise. Quoting from the encyclical, alongside profit-oriented private enterprises and the various types of uh, public enterprise, there must be room for commercial entities based on mutualist principles and pursuing social ends to take root and express themselves. It is from their reciprocal encounter in the marketplace that one may expect hybrid forms of commercial behavior to emerge and hence an attentiveness to ways of civilizing the economy. Charity and truth in this case requires that shape and structure be given to those types of econo economic initiative which without rejecting profit aim at a higher goal than the mere logic of the exchange of equivalents of profit as an end in itself. Now, once again, we may ask ourselves if Benedict is merely fantasizing about new forms of enterprise. But in fact, such enterprises are not new. They exist, have always existed, and are, by and large, quite successful. Many examples could be advanced but some of the more prominent ones include the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation of Spain or the Cooperative Economy of Emilia Romagna. <coughs> Me too. Uh, the Mondragon Co uh, Cooperative is a 50-year-old collection of worker cooperatives um, and is one of the largest corporations in Spain. It has over 100,000 worker owners doing more than $20 billion in sales. But Mondragon is not just a business. It operates schools, research institutes, a university, training institutes, a social welfare system, a credit union, all of which are self-funded. <laughs> The peculiar thing is, if you want to see an example of the libertarian ideal in action, you have to go to the Spanish distributists. In Emilia Romagna, the area in Italy around Bologna, worker cooperatives provide 40% of the GDP, 